Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense! Tonight, Voyage Through Darkness, starring Olivia de Havilland and Reginald Gardner. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Tonight from Hollywood, we bring you the distinguished American leading lady of the screen, Miss Olivia de Havilland. Miss de Havilland appears as a girl named Judith Webster, who found herself embarked upon a journey into darkness. Traveling with her on this perilous voyage is that suave and debonair actor, Mr. Reginald Gardner. So with the performances of Mr. Haviland and Mr. Gardner in this seagoing adventure play, we again hope to keep you in suspense. It happened in 1939, shortly before England and Germany were at war. I was in London, serving as traveling companion to Mrs. Edna Prescott, a wealthy, quite elderly American woman. She wasn't a pleasant person, and the city's practice blackouts were a particular source of annoyance to her. I remember thinking how ironic it was that she should die during one of them. I even thought it the cause, until the doctors assured me her death was due to a common heart ailment. I was very busy for the next few days, arranging passage to America, getting my train ticket down to Southampton, and and carrying out the promise I had made so many times to Mrs. Prescott. I didn't relish any part of that. Uh, Miss Webster, uh, Miss Webster, oh yes, 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 uh, the young woman who's escorting the casket. Oh, here's your ticket. Uh, uh, gate five, please. Both trains for Southampton. This way, please. The young woman who's escorting the casket. He said it so... so matter-of-factly, as if such things occurred every day. I suppose they do. And yet... Every minute on that train I felt uncomfortable, on edge. It seemed as if the, tri- sou- the trip to Southampton and the steamer docks would never end. I remember how glad I was when it did, and how cheerful the steward's voice sounded as he greeted me at the head of the gangway. Good evening, miss. Welcome aboard. May I show you to your cabin? Please do, steward. I, I'm very tired. A 12A, a B dick. Uh, this way, miss. I hope they get him all right, miss. Uh... Get who? Police have you clue on Blackheart Killer. Boy, that Blackheart Killer. The police have a new clue on him, he says. Oh, oh, yes. An awful thing. Ah, here we are, Miss 12A. You have it all to yourself. Thank you, Stuart. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, here you are. Oh, it's quite all right, Miss. Uh, thanks, and good night. Uh, call me if you need me now. Good night. In my stateroom. Perfectly safe, I realized how jittery I'd been, how upset. And now, how relieved. Suddenly I began to laugh, right out loud. My fears had been so foolish, so very foolish. I went out on deck. I no longer felt tired, and I wanted to watch the lights of the coastline fading away from us. 
I was standing near the aft rail, quietly looking out across the water when he first spoke. Beautiful, isn't it? Oh. I'm sorry. Did I frighten you? Oh. Yes. Yes, you did. I, I didn't realize there was anyone near that lifeboat. Well, I'm sorry. I was sure you saw me. I never would have... Well, uh... it's all right, really. I, I've been nervous tonight anyway. I, I'm not always so jumpy. What you need is an ocean voyage. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Were you watching the shore lights? Yes, and I, I never did answer your question. They are beautiful. Very. And the sea alone is beautiful. She has moods, you know, just like a woman. Gentle sometimes and soothing. Then suddenly flying into a rage and dashing things to pieces. And then quieting right down again. That's right. I see we feel the same about her. Does she frighten you sometimes? The same way women frighten me. Oh? I mean, uh, when I don't understand them. Well, I thought it was the general male consensus that we weren't supposed to be understood. Only loved. Isn't that the rest of it? Something like that. Anyway, it's a philosophy I disagree with. That's refreshing. Ah, the lady is amused. Oh, not at all. I, it's, it's just that the lady detects a bachelor. <laughs> because I have a mind of my own? Well, that's one good clue. But listen to me. I'm lecturing to you as if a... I believe that bit of tritonus ends up as if I'd known you all my life. Well, wait a minute. There's another which makes it perfectly all right. It's that uh, shipboard friendships last forever business. <laughs> uh, however, my name is Alan Bruce. Yours? Judith Webster. A miss or... Miss. Good. Well, we got through that. Quite nicely. You suppose we could get through a dance? There's music in the salon. Well, there's no longer any view of the shore lights. Uh, however, you did say the sea alone was beautiful. I was so wrong. There's nothing as monotonous as all that water. It is kind of uh, flat. Yes, well, uh, let's trade it for champagne, shall we? Be with you in a minute. Where are you going? Well, just over here. Wanted to do the skipper a little favor. What is it? Oh, oh, the lifeboat cover. How did that ever get so loose? I, I, uh... I don't know. I I noticed it a while back. There. Well, that should do it. Strange. It was almost as if... Oh, no. Well, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to get melodramatic and suggest that someone might have been hiding there. You mean a stowaway? Yes. Well, of course, it's silly. I wouldn't say so. You're joking. Not at all. It's quite possible someone could have slipped on board and hid in that boat. That's why I think we shouldn't mention this to anyone. What? It would only cause an alarm. But I don't understand. Do you really think there might have been someone... Someone... <laughs> I shall never forget that moment and the thoughts which went racing through my mind, my, my nervousness on the train, those horrible headlines about, about the blackout killer that newsboy had shouted an hour before, Alan's strange attitude about the lifeboat, the whole unpleasant nature of this voyage, and my promise to Mrs. Prescott. I, I wanted to turn and run, wanted to cry out, but somehow I... I couldn't. It, it was like a dream when you... when you can't move. And then the darkness was swept away and I was no longer dreaming. I was... I was in Alan's arms dancing. There were... there were laughing, carefree people all about us and the ship's salon was so bright and friendly. I was ashamed for even thinking there might have been anything wrong. You had enough? They just brought our champagne. Well, in that case, yes. I'd about given up. Well, a fine way to talk about my dancing. You know perfectly well what I mean. Oh, all right. Let her go, waiter. Right you are, sir. Uh, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> all right. Thank you, waiter. That'll be all. Yes, sir. Oh, that does look good. And is. Well, what should we toast to? Shipboard friendships? Shipboard friendships. You know, I... Uh... What is it? Something wrong? No, no, nothing at all. Just thought I saw some, and I. Will you excuse me a moment? Well, of course. I won't be long. Give us a 
quite all right. This... Oh, excuse me, miss, uh, but the uh, gentleman, he dropped this billfold. Oh, thank you, waiter. I didn't notice. Would you just leave it there on the table? Uh, very good, miss. There you are. The billfold fell open as the waiter placed it on the table. I couldn't take my eyes from it. There was an identification card in plain sight. The name on the card was not Alan Bruce. It was Charles Drew. Sorry to have run off that way. I I never should have. Didn't know the fellow at all. Say, you you haven't touched your champagne. You you let all the kick go out of it. You. I'm afraid all the kick has gone out of it. Well, we'll soon take care of it. Oh, my billfold. Where did you find it? It was on the floor. The waiter picked it up. The, the, the waiter? Did he look at it? No. Well, we found an honest man, eh? Have to remember him. Hadn't you better look to see if you found an honest woman? <laughs> I'll, I'll take a chance. On my honesty, yes. But what about a woman's curiosity? Oh, I see. Well, now you know. Well, I must be more careful of my things in future. But you know, I'm sure you wouldn't tell anyone anything. No? No. I knew from the very first that I could trust you implicitly. Stop your music. Stop your music. Stop your music. Stop. Stop. What's up, Stuart? Why is the music stop? What's the matter? Attention! Attention, everybody! Everybody! The first officer has something to say to us. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to break in on your dancing this way, but I assure you this won't take long. We've just received a radiogram from London, and I must ask your cooperation. Well, something important? Maybe something it's war with Germany. Oh, no, 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 it isn't war. Nothing nearly as alarming as that. However, the London police suspect that we're carrying a stowaway, and they've asked us to make a thorough search of the ship and report back to them. Really? Must be a criminal. A criminal? Oh, no. Perhaps it's a blackout killer. Killer on our ship? Now, wait, wait a moment, please, ladies and gentlemen. It won't help to get excited. The ship is being searched. He'll never get off. All we ask is that you keep your cabins locked. I was afraid this might happen. How long did you expect to keep it from them? Well, naturally, I was hoping they'd never... Oh, Judith. Oh, Judith, what's wrong? Where are you going? Hey, look at him. Oh, what the devil? <clears throat> hey, what's the matter, handsome? She ran out on you? Oh, please, let me through, will you? Uh, okay, sure. Go to it, mister. Don't let her get away. You know, maybe she thinks that you're the blackout killer. <laughs> For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Olivia de Havilland and Reginald Gardner. You have heard them in the first act of Voyage Through Darkness by Joel Malone. Tonight's tale of suspense. It is a fact that connoisseurs of many foreign lands have discovered the excellence of Roma Wines the greatness of California's wine country from which Roma comes. But millions of Americans also know these things and have made Roma by far the most popular, the largest selling of all America's wines. Here at home, Roma wines are truly inexpensive. For only pennies a glass, your meals, your entertaining, can have the added delight of superb Roma wines. You will find them constant in quality, of unvarying excellent taste and character. Fine products of age-old winemaking skill, perfected by modern knowledge. To start enjoying this really fine wine yourself, simply place on the table with dinner tomorrow a well-chilled bottle of hearty, ruby-red Roma California Burgundy. Don't worry about what the meal is or what glasses you have handy. You'll be delightfully surprised at how much extra enjoyment you get from your meal. How Roma wine makes even the simplest meal a feast. Enjoy Roma wines anytime with meals when entertaining. It's the easy and expensive way to make a big hit with guests and with the family. Be sure to ask your dealer for R O M A, Roma wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And 
And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Miss Olivia de Havilland and Mr. Reginald Gardner as they continue Voyage Through Darkness, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I never know why I left the dining salon without telling them. Certainly there could no longer be any doubt. It was all too clear, that loose canvas covering on the lifeboat, the way he'd been standing there, even the name he had given me, Alan Bruce. I saw it later on the regular passenger list. He must have killed Bruce and thrown him overboard, taking not only his name, but his stateroom and clothes. It was all so, so fantastic. Worse than anything else. I had almost fallen in love with him. He knew that, I'm certain. It was why he was so confident that I wouldn't tell anyone. And I didn't. Not even when I spoke to the first officer about... uh, about my promise to Mrs. Prescott. I wanted to tell him, but somehow I... Mr. Webster, I'll arrange it for early tomorrow morning. Uh, Most of the passengers will be asleep. Thank you. I... I, uh... I suppose it's rather unusual, but uh, then Mrs. Prescott was an unusual woman. Hmm. I haven't conducted a burial at sea since the last war. However, I'm not entirely unprepared. The company officials spoke to me about this before sailing, and... Well, now, don't you worry, Miss Webster. The ceremony will be quite in order, I assure you. Thank you. I'll bid you good day, ma'am. You haven't done that. <gasps> oh, I'm sorry. I seem to have a habit of startling you. What do you want? How long have you been standing there? Long enough to overhear that conversation. You had no right. What are you doing in my cabin? Uh, please, I know what you're going to say. I had no right to be here or to listen. However, it's fortunate that I did. What do you mean? I didn't know that it was Mrs. Prescott's desire to be buried at sea. No one knew it. But it was her last wish I promised her would be carried out. And tomorrow morning you're keeping that promise? Yes. And now, if you'll excuse me, I I, I don't feel very well. I'd like Uh, to... Wait, please, Judith. You've been avoiding me, haven't you? Yes, I have. I hope it's only because you've been upset about Mrs. Prescott, I mean. That's one reason. Oh, I'm sorry. I I almost thought we were beginning to, uh, well, to become very good friends. You know, you're the only person on board whom I can trust. You're very sure about that, aren't you? Of course. You know who I am and what I'm doing on this ship, and yet you've told no one. I wanted to. I know. Women were never meant to keep secrets. However, I'm going to ask you to keep one more. I'd rather not. Sorry. I must include you this time. You see, it requires a change in your plan so they'll fit in with mine. I'm afraid I don't understand. It's very simple. Judith, this may upset you, but uh, I must ask that you tell them that you've changed your mind, that you don't want Mrs. Prescott buried at sea. What? You remember what they said. Even if they couldn't find the stowaway, he'd never get off the ship. Well, he, he could get off very easily if you'd allow him to take Mrs. Prescott's place in that casket. What, in that casket? Yes. Clever, eh? Clever? Well, not every man would think of it. Simple as it may seem, everyone searching the ship, questioning each passenger, and all the while the man they were seeking would be safe inside the casket. He would only have to wait patiently, and then be hoisted from the ship's hold, lowered onto the pier, and whisked safely away in a funeral car when he was discovered by the funeral attendants? Oh, I'm sure they'd be so shocked at the dead coming to life, he'd have little trouble in... Stop it! Stop it, do you hear? If you haven't any respect for the dead, I'm afraid I have. Oh, Mrs. Prescott, you mean. I should have told you that part of it. Uh, Her last wish has already been carried out. You see, her body was removed from the casket the night we sailed. Mrs. Prescott is already buried at sea. You've thought of everything, haven't you? 
Yes. In my position, one must. I remained in my cabin all that day, and next. I was afraid to see him again. I can't explain the strange fascination he held over me. I remember how surprised the first officer looked when I told him I had changed my mind about the burial. It was as if he sensed the truth, as if he knew Mrs. Prescott's body wasn't in the casket, that it was empty. But, of course, it was only my imagination and my sense of guilt for this terrible wrong I was doing. When we sailed into New York Harbor, I went out on deck. He was standing there near the port rail. I went up to him. He turned and smiled as if he'd been expecting me. Oh, there you are. I've missed you. Haven't been under the weather? No, I, I've been perfectly well. You had me worried, not showing up at dinner. You know, I've come to depend on you. Yes, I know. I've decided not to let you get away from me. After this is all over, we must, um... You haven't much time. Oh, that's right. This may not be easy. Uh, wish me luck. Haven't I done more than that already? Yes, of course. Only, uh, I mean, uh, like this. As suddenly as he had taken me in his arms, he released me, and I remained there by the rail as he hurried away. I watched as the ship moved on into the harbor under the guidance of the tugboats with their shrill, insistent little whistles. I listened to the shouts of the crew and longshoremen. Soon we were alongside the pier. And the steward was shouting from the head of the gangway, and then, then I saw it. The casket. They were lowering it toward the pier. There was a car waiting, a long black car, and suddenly I realized what I had done, what a fool I had been, what a cowardly, frightened little fool. <laughs> Don't let them take it. Don't let them. Wait, please. You mustn't touch that casket. There's something wrong. Huh? Hey, what's the matter with you, lady? Get out of the way, will you? But there's a man in there alive. He's hiding. Sure, sure. Hide and go seek. He's played in the coffin. Go on, lady. We've got work to do. Slam those rear doors tight, Ed. Please. Oh. Please. You must listen to me. If you won't, I'll call the police. Someone has got to stop him. He'll... Did I hear you call for the police? Oh, yes. These men won't listen to me, but there's a... A man hiding in this casket. Of course there is. We put him in there, Judith. What did you say? I said we put him in there. Or rather, we let him walk right into our trap. Wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me there's someone else inside that casket? Well, surely you're not trying to say that you thought I was in there. But who else? Who else? <laughs> Why, the blackout killer, of course. Then, then he's getting away. You're letting him get away. No, no, Judith. No. Those men know who's inside that casket. And they know right where to take him. Take him? You know, Judith, for someone who helped plan this entire thing, you're acting very strangely. I'm acting strangely? It's almost as if you didn't know who I am at all. I don't. What? I said I, I don't know you. I, I still don't. But... But, but, but the night I dropped my billfold, I, I thought surely you... All I learned that night was your real name, Charles Drew. You, you mean you didn't look at the rest of my papers? Certainly not. But that's amazing. Say, you are different. Yes, and I suppose you're the everyday run-of-the-mill type. Look, what is this? Oh, it's all very simple, Judith. I, I thought you'd learned of my affiliation with Scotland Yard when you had my billfold. You mean you're a detective? I've even been called a bloodhound. Then, all this time, you've been trailing the killer. That's right. We had a tip-off he might be on this ship, and when I discovered the loose lifeboat covering, I was certain of it. Then Alan Bruce, he... he wasn't murdered at all. He never existed. 
Just a name I was using. Good Lord, Judith, you know detectives never travel under their own names. It just isn't done. No, no, everything has to be done the hard way. I suppose that that's why you just didn't find the killer and arrest him on board. Oh, no, hardly. You see, I couldn't find him. Searched the ship from top to bottom, I... I guess he really would have given me the slip if I hadn't looked in the casket. He was hiding there all the time. No, it was empty. I don't get it. Neither did I at first. Then I began to wonder why he would remove Mrs. Prescott's body from her casket unless it was part of some plan. And? And I decided that it was. A weird yet thoroughly clever plan. Remember I told you not every man would think of it? Yes, you did say that. He had only to wait patiently until the ship docked. Then, at the last minute, slip into the casket... And be hoisted out of the hold onto the pier and whisked safely away in the funeral car. And to think, if it hadn't been for you, he might have gotten away with it. Oh, you helped plenty by calling off that burial and leaving the way open for him. Oh, no, Charles. I nearly wrecked everything. I... I thought you were the killer. (laughs) <laughs> well, no wonder you avoided me. I was so mixed up. I, I thought I knew so much. No, no, it's, it's my fault, darling. I overestimated you. Is it all clear to you now? Well, I... No, that is, it, it's clear about how, well, the, the killer and, and the casket, but I, I, I don't know whether... What? You mean about the lifeboat and... Uh... No, no, about you. I, I'm, I'm not clear whether... Or... You mean whether or not I'm really Scotland Yard? Well, I am. You you can really... No, I'm just not sure whether... But, Judith, there's nothing else. Oh, except, of course, uh, that I love you and... uh... What was that again? I said I love you. Uh, How can I be sure? Judith, darling. Oh, Oh, Charles. (laughs) Uh, That makes it very clear. And so closes Voyage Through Darkness, starring Olivia de Havilland and Reginald Gardner. Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. If you are one who does not yet know how much and how delightfully Roma wines add to your meals, well, let me urge you not to miss out any longer on such a treat as this. There is nothing complicated about it. Just get and serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try the many different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you like best of all. Try Roma California Sherry with its wonderful nut-like flavor as an appetizer. Or ruby red Roma Burgundy, or the deliciously delicate-flavored Roma Sautern. These superb wines cost you only pennies a glassful, yet they make even the simplest meal taste like a million dollars. Get some today, and if your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. America's largest selling wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Olivia de Havilland. I have certainly enjoyed appearing here tonight on Suspense, which is a program I've admired for a very long time. Our government has asked us to bring to the attention of women listeners a very important message. In spite of our wonderful victories on all the fighting fronts, You must remember that the war is by no means over or nearly over. Hundreds of thousands of women must get into war work this year. You're desperately needed, both because you are admirably fitted for these jobs and because you represent the only adequate source of labor to replace the men in the armed forces and in the heavy war industries. Make a realistic appraisal of your household duties and your state of health. Talk it over with your family and with friends who are now employed in war work or in one of the branches of the women's armed services. If you are still in doubt after analyzing the situation, go to the United States Employment Service Office and ask for information about the kinds of full-time or part-time jobs for which you are best suited. We cannot stress too highly how vitally necessary your immediate action can be. 
And here is a thought for everyone. Six million Americans are fighting overseas. Here at home, let us all remember that until final victory everywhere, winning the war still comes first with every last one of us. Reginald Gardner appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of Darrell F. Zanuck's Wilson. Next Thursday, same time, Joseph Cotton will be your star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.